So we are delighted uh, to have uh, our poet who's going to read tonight, Amy McLennan. Uh, her first full collection, full length collection of books, The Body, A Tree, was published by Moon Path Press in 2016 and was the runner up for the Poetry Society of Virginia Book Award. It's a great book, so I'm sure she's going to be reading, reading from it. Her work has been uh, widely published. She grew up in the peninsula south of San Francisco, but as I said earlier, now lives in, uh, in Ashland. So she's moved to the, uh, the Rogue Valley. She received an MA in English from Notre, Notre Dame de Namur University in Belmont, California, and sits on the board of the Chautauqua Poets and Writers in Ashland. She's also the managing editor of the Cortland Review, and a poetry editor for Bon Bouquet. She's also published two chapbooks, Weathering in 2012 and The Fragile Day, 2011. And she's been featured on The Writer's Almanac with Garrison Keeler and on Verse Daily. So would you join me in welcoming our poet for tonight, Amy McLennan. Amy. I think that's good. That, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, this has been a funny day. I'm just saying it right now. Funny drive, funny day. And I'm really happy to be here right now. Um, at one point, I started writing poems um, about the body as a metaphor. So that came, that just generated probably seven to nine poems about the body. So the title poem of the collection, The Body a Tree, is what I'm going to lead with. The body a tree, might think itself lemon, overgrown behind a steel gray house, and pulls in fat bees, holds to bright and sour, or imagines itself almond, squirrels crazing through branches, cracking furred holes, a chattering all limbs, but maybe apricot, sap almost glowing on rough bark with leaves to drop, shine, wither on grass. The body wishes for soil, for fruit, for light to grow through, wood hardening to an ache. And this is um, a poem I wrote when I was going through Ashland, wasn't living there, um, but stopped there with someone. And I think that's when I fell in love with the city of Ashland. Between two ranges. It's where you think you'll stop. A smallish town. Houses with porches that seemed like promise. The two of you will cruise through in an afternoon and the cafe will serve coffee sweet with hot milk. The chairs feel familiar, the tables impossibly smooth. Floors will creak like home. When you walk back to the truck, you'll see a single hawk on a light post and say, luck and furs on a mountain ridge with silhouettes of couples dancing, you imagine they'll never change. If you write a love letter to disappointment, allow brevity, <laughs> allow sweetness, allow smudged ink, 
Do not use exclamation points. <laughs> Do not speak in the third person. Bring your best paper. Tolerate the passage of time. You may drink water. Try not to drink wine. Write alone, but imagine others in the room. Use adjectives if you like, and end sentences with prepositions. Do not repeat yourself. Invite generosity, permit humor. Avoid sarcasm, but accept grief. Draft the letter as if you could only write it once. Use a long salutation and a short goodbye. This is the one that Garrison Keeler liked. <laughs> and I have to say, it's really weird hearing Garrison Keeler reading your words out loud. It, it was just once like, oh my God, man. <laughs> this is odd. Um, but it is, because um, I, it's like, okay, fine, yes, we're in autumn, we're about to go into winter, I love to snowshoe, I love to hike, but mostly I live in summer, my favorite time of the year, so this is where this comes from. The daylight is huge. The daylight is huge. 5 a.m. and the sky already blushing gray. Morning so full of blue, the clouds almost sheepish as they wisp over hills. High noon only happens in June. Midday, a tipping point. The scale weighed down on both sides with blazed hours. And the evenings... So drawn out, the land lies stunned by that shambling last light. Looking for an oracle. Spool it on out for me. Where to turn left, the bananas to pick, the men to catch, the men to ditch. Tell me when my nails will break and the roof will fail. Tip me to gossips and scratched out phone book names. List out my losses, hearing gone in 10 years. The loves I'll bury. Line them up so I can swallow them all without the coil of worry. Choice never stopped the clots in anyone's veins. Or the smooth sky pressing down and I want my days laid flat, my facts splayed out, a plan, a map to the last damn chicken bone that sticks in my throat. <laughs> uh, so, this poem is called Kintsukuroi and the epigraph is a definition of that word, the art of repairing pottery with gold or silver. Kintsukuroi. Imagine the bowl on a table cupping late summer fruit. Think of the tip or knock and pottery once whole, now in shards. It could be five pieces, nine, 14. The bowl breaks differently with any given drop. This time, silver patterns the seams like long, slick rivers instead of the jags of a mountain ridge. Imagine our bodies, the shine of 10-year-old scars, knobs of reset bones. Think of the way we fill our crumbling teeth and hold our own gold. We piece our fragments together a new way each time. We repair what we can. Our vessels holding blood and bone make a changed shape, and we long to be more gorgeous with the breakage. Oh. 
It takes a few days. She shops. Blue bands to tie her hair back. Nail clippers, sweatshirts, socks. Two bars of ivory. The housework. She scrubs with Dutch cleanser, no gloves. The bathtub almost radiant, even the drain. A guy strips the board from her window, replaces it with glass so pure everything can be seen. She double checks her spelling in the email she answers. Shared, not shard. Care, not came. She's always had trouble with beautiful. And this is a, a different drain. This is for my mother. The drain. I don't know what to say when you come home. It's gone, and you're left with a bandage wrapped around your chest. I heat soup for supper, complain about the lineup on TV until it's time to change your drain. You ask if I'd like to watch. I do. I want to see. Pinned to thin strips of gauze, the plastic bottle trails a tube that snakes its way under your arm, the pieces translucent, almost graceful. No more than this to let your closed wound weep. You do it without a hitch. Pour the fluid out, check the tube, zip your top, and when you're done, you seem pleased. And I say I'll slip something into that flask, a goldfish, a gummy bear. You laugh as you get ready for bed. A locket, two frosted red dice. And we giggle as you pull the blanket up. A chess piece, maybe. A key. <coughs> what I know for sure. <coughs> Regret melts only to shape itself. Pillar candle wax, hot pooling to a mock lake. Thin light, waiting burn, liquid cup brimming to spill, Harden, brittle, sweet mess, always blurring something, anything, everything in the end. It took a lot to love you. Now, this is kind of a funny poem for me because um, I, if, if you show me a new object or, you know, just I want to touch it. I, I like to touch things. It's like, yeah, hey, tape dispenser, this is good. Um, and a friend of mine, he's a motorcycle, motorcycle mechanic. Um, also, he loves old cars. And he had this thing sitting in his garage. And I'm like, what is this thing? I was like, I must touch it. And I was like, I got my fingers all greased up, but I had to find out what it was. Um, so... This is a poem called Castellation, and the epigraph is engineering term, having indentations similar to battlements. Castellation. On the workbench, grimed up, slightly rusted, a chunk of carved out metal the size of a child's hand, donut shaped and jagged, I pick it up, trace the Greek key lines, see the threads inside, a nut or a very big bolt. I ask my friend what it is. A castellated nut, he says, used on very old cars, something to keep a vibrating screw in place. But you can't overturn, underturn it. You have to twist and lock, get that turn just right. 
I've come over to have coffee. A bit tight myself, after a long call with my lover, wait, my ex-lover, about how we'll sort things out. Who gets what? The cell phone minutes, cheese knives, big screen TV. We were careful, not too harsh, not too delicate. Of course, now I think of us as bolt to nut, the care we'd taken to grease our pairing. We did not mean to strip our threads, but it was a jarring ride, a hard shaking. Our metals broke, tore our castle apart. Now these are the happier poems, yay! <laughs> Um, so another body poem, the body in summer with sinews all syrup and skin sweat licked seems always out facing unfurled slow spasm of open and want even hair more eager twisting out fast to bleach and hold July light the body in summer now a boat small sway in water, a float of belly and back, as it craves melon, tomato, corn warm from the field, and the body knows well the length of the day, tries to think only of coral skies and sure desire, long peel of the ne naked evening sun. Eh, okay, I'll go with this one. A kiss on the cheek. It seems chaste enough, a pursed lip tap. But with some, your mouth's so near, you know how close you really are. A gradual lean, pause just an inch away. He feels your breath, a weight and with the bow of your lips, you place a tiny glare of hold and sway to his face. Then you pull back, again the weight, the kiss flushing there, your slight sigh now lighting it up. And with the tongue flick to the spot you just left, it's now a keepsake, favorite stain, languished smoke mark, a hushed invitation for soon. Telegram. After we sprawl, our arms looped, my foot against your calf, your hand on my thigh, a completed circuit, uncomplicated. As we drift, your fingers start the nerve spasm of sleep. Morse code tap as you passage, a message I do not know how to decipher. I let your dispatch play through me, chains of letters that tell everything you haven't said. So many words strung together, and I can't make sense of them. I am sinking too into a night where we turn and settle, our communiques in the form of pulse and slow breath. Before sleep takes me, I imagine a cable to you, each word well chosen, costly. One of us will leave. I will remember my body ached for you like no other. Stop. So these are new poems, and this is a true thing when I say um, I was having problems with my left shoulder um, about a year and a half ago. It was really bugging me. It was just this massive spasm in there, and I didn't know what was going on. It was annoying me. So I thought I'd write a love letter to my shoulder. <laughs> 
And I swear to God, two weeks later, the pain went away. So if, <laughs> give it a go, just, just try it. Two weeks. Ode to my left shoulder. You write love notes to me in the way of pain. A slightly, a slicing whisper of I adore you as I wince when I lift my arm across my chest. You hum a small tone of ache, and when I roll left in bed, you slip me tokens, sharp and ripped. I look for the source. What I do at my desk, how I grab my water on a bike, the way I pick up the damn trash. I adjust, and still you sing to me. Sometimes a pang, sometimes the long throb that digs in deep. I'm listening, I say in the dark. You sigh back with bright impingements. I try again. How I grab my purse, the tilt of my head, and you continue to gift me with hurts. I wonder what scares you. What trap you think has snapped. If you're trying to gnaw us free, slowly, with devoted teeth and from the inside. <laughs> XO, XO, Amy, yes. <laughs> Hurricane lamp. The base of oil feeds one slim wick, a soaking pole. Ignition and flame, smoke in the shade contained, while things outside so simply happen. Small touches of skin, wrecking of beds, figs and berries waiting to be eaten. Stars seem to restitch the sky. The burnt match sits with just a breath the world can go quiet. So if anybody is ever down in Ashland, let's go hiking, because I love hiking. And this is, this is actually a decommissioned trail that is, oof, this is a nasty trail. This, ooh, I don't even know what the percentage of the grade is, but it's up and it's horrible. And uh, so the epigraph is a trail in the Ashland watershed, Oregon. And the name of the trail is Pete's Punisher. <laughs> Pete's Punisher. I don't know who Pete is, but I think he's a jerk. <laughs> this bushwhack trail on an outdated map makes like a beast after the first turn, straight up, no mercy, slick in any season, ice in winter, powdered dirt glass in summer. Of course I know it's best to run it up. Light tap of boots, tight mountain goat until sweat flows down my face like November rain, and I'm cursing Pete as I hit another curve. See the next ascent, and it's the weird dream where I'm being chased by monsters and not getting anywhere, just running and running, and is Pete dead or maybe hobbling around on arthritic knees, but my heart rate is jacked. I'm so focused on the burn in my legs and lungs, and don't stop. Don't stop, don't stop, don't. And the end of the trail is close, so Pete, you bastard, talk to me now about punishment. Let's sit down and breathe, and you can whisper in my ear. <laughs> A later body poem. The body not falling. Wonders how gravity even exists when rising seems natural, when breathing pulls it above the syllables of a sleeping lover. The body not falling, still delicate, shatterable, a twist of orange in thin blown glass. It knows the carriages of circulation, heart and lungs expanding, collapsing, pure rhythms. The body thinks of air on the neck, just brushing the hair, exhalations of another, 
falling and not falling. I swear to God, this is a word. Cottawample. Epigraph. To travel purposefully toward an as yet unknown destination. <laughs> you don't know it yet. How I womple these days. My steps a wobble, but still selfing with all that I have. I've behinded what I loved, and caudily I heft a sweet space under my ribs as I tramp a slow pace off time. I have no choice. I'll look for some honeyed place, soon or soonish not, and the cross stitch sutures in my dinged up heart will hold. I know it's only November, but still, March will be here soon. <laughs> I really want March. Uh, it's fine. I love, I, it'll be good. March days. Because promises, promises. A bluebird morning followed in a snap by clouds in the shape of a dog from childhood. That St. Bernard with arthritic hips. Clouds that hang in upward vision waiting to dump a big bag of rain when I finally bust out the good shoes. The clouds will cross town, transforming. Dog, to cow, to hunched over tree, to almost the outline of Texas. They will shed themselves for miles. I like to think the water in my hair is the same that beads a stranger a few blocks over to the west. Another true story. See, I, I mostly tell the truth in, in poetry. Yeah, I lie occasionally. But no, this, this is... So when I get ideas, I write them down in a notebook, just little, little scraps of ideas in a notebook. And I have this pretty substantial notebook that I record my ideas in it one day. It's like, I guess this is my ode to the notebook. Um, it's just called Notebook. And I was like, I love you, my notebook. It's next to my bed. Notebook. I call them thought scraps. Snaps of lines, images, slant rhymed word strings kept in a book on the nightstand. It's a mess. My nightstand too, but I mean that dark blue book, everything written in quick slop hand, a cluttered jumble all over the page. I don't even note the date just the start of each new month. I go in for a jump when I need one, a flip through and grab to start something new. I read it today, the whole silly thing, like a novel. I didn't like that book. <laughs> a shabby fiction of me, pinging what's gone bad in 10 years, death and breakups and every kind of leaving one can do in a life. I feel bad for the writer, but as a reviewer, I can give it only one star. Some dots should never be connected. The story begins with, I mouth you. Today it ends with, I've never hung anyone's moon. I still mean to title this poem, swear to God. This is like the third time I've read this. No title, one day it will happen, untitled. It was me, it is May, and the flashing late spring leaves won't care. It was over, it's an open sky, and the sugar sits in a covered bowl, pure and aloof. It was tears, it is tears, and the house flies flit in to bump the screens. I light candles now. June is coming. 
It is here. It waits for nothing. The magazines slip in their pile of gloss. In one, I misread, egrets as regrets. I won't look up. The idea of softness. I can't take them anymore. Soft things. My pillow's too cushy. My bed too mama bear. I want crunch between my teeth. Carrots and pretzels, not cukes and croissants. I no longer have a man's hand in my hair, and it too has gone brittle. Little ends, knots, and snapping right off. Even my body is changing, sinews tightening down. This shift to hardening is inevitable. I was too soft before, and that only led to trouble. A friend told me, you don't have to be tough to be safe. My heart laughed. Shedding. This is for one of my cats. She can't stop, my pouty little cat. Frantic throw rug squirms, lunatic rubs against the good couch. Her furred self leaves a track through the place. Feline here, feline here, feline. And she takes to the bedspread almost like worship. I try to comb her, I do, but she runs from the brush like fleeing a fire as I sit on the floor, look to the vacuum, and see her hair as surrendered in her own style, tossed, granted, bestowed. <laughs> as I say, with probably enough cat hair on me to make a kitten. And these two poems, I'm, I'm, I'm three poems away. I got three. Um, I'd had a really bad neighbor for a while, a really bad household of neighbors. And um, finally, now that they're gone and I'm sleeping well and I'm not waking up at 11.33 and 2.17 and 5.33 in the morning, I'm really grateful. Um, but this is kind of the anxiety out of having neighbors that you think are pretty much selling a lot of drugs and inviting their sketchy friends over. If you expect drama, then vacuum first. Someone could knock. That stranger who stayed after a party, he still has the borrowed book. A friend you offended, you'd fill her arm with tulips. The sketchy drunk neighbor, he confuses his place with yours. You would have to open the door, turn some away, let some in. And you have to make sure the crumbs, cat hair, light settle of dust are sucked up because drama is coming and you need to keep things neat. All the easy clutter hoovered up before you hear knuckles against wood, the chirp of the doorbell box vibrating from the ceiling. Vacuum everything away to a disposable bag. Even your heart suction clean, especially your scared, heaving heart. The garage. So much eviction so much rage. These neighbors in a chase out phase, dodging the calls and notices left on their door. He sleeps in the garage while she smokes and keeps him locked out, opens the front door only when he's hungry and after an hour of screaming. Three in the morning, bottles dumped in bins then fished out. But when she's gone, he climbs the roof, slithers in a window, blinds now fluttering with fingers and eyes, peers and looks, paranoia dripping down the glass. They say it will be a few more days, a few more days. That poor yellow cat, though, 
He comes and goes as he pleases, probably chases mice in the field. The future means nothing. Now this last poem is my actual Valentine to poets. I swear to God, this is true. <laughs> I close my eyes when I listen to poetry. People notice, but I still close my eyes in class at readings. The table legs, scarred floors, cups of coffee get in the way, almost blur the words. Even the light is too much. I don't want to see you, poet speaking from the books, poet of the open mic. Not your fingertips scanning down the page, not your mouth. I want to be your mouth. In the dark, your tongue between our lips, the liquid L's and R's, a fricative F in that inverted kiss. I wait for your keening words, your aching words, first spoken with no one else there, sounds of animal or infant, fragmented, green, pawed through and kept, still naked. And when you pause, I breathe as you do, leaning toward the air in your throat, your projected wanting, your final line. Thank you so much. Oh, come on, hit me. <laughs> or don't, that's it. OK. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. When did you start writing? Uh, <laughs> okay. I thought I was out of here. Um, <laughs> crap, OK. Um, when did you know you wanted to, to write poetry? I, it was late in life for me. Um, it was. I was in my 30s, and I know so many poets that um, knew it when they were seven, knew it when they were 16, knew it when they were 21, and I had nothing. And I do remember, I had friends, I remember turning 30 and having friends that were musicians or dancers or had some artistic pursuit, and I was so envious of them. And I had nothing, and it was because, I actually thought I was gonna be a fiction writer. I really thought, it was like a friend of mine was like, yeah, okay, you write cute emails at work, you ought to do something with that. Because I was whining about feeling kind of deprived in my life. Like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna be a fiction writer, I'm gonna write a novel, I'm gonna write short stories, it's gonna be fiction, fiction, fiction. And the only class I could get at night was half fiction, half poetry. Like, poetry, which whatever and then it wasn't so much because my poetry it really sucked it was horrifically bad the trick was I started reading 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 a lot of poetry and that just made me fall in love with it I just and I, then I started taking workshops I had no business being in I've said this before, it's like, I had no business being in, in certain workshops, and people were exceptionally generous, or at times exceptionally not generous, and kind of beat the crap out of me, but that was a good thing at the time. It's like I skinned my knees, saying, wow, that's horrible. It's like, I know, trust me, I know. <laughs> but that was, um, that was the thing that just kept me going to keep writing more and reading more. So. Yeah, in, in my early 30s, and that's kind of late in life for most folks, because I know so many poets, it's just like, I knew, I get, I knew at seven. I knew when I began writing, I should be a poet, and I'm like, uh, was not me, wasn't me. I'm also jealous of those folks. Who did you read? Dylan Thomas, man. 
I swear, uh, he, he, that's just a workshop in sound in one poem. Fern Hill, for me, that is the poem when it comes to rhythm and sound, that's it. If you just want one poem to teach some person, an alien, let's just say we're being invaded, <laughs> and it's like, oh, describe this poetry thing to me, it would be Fern Hill by Dylan Thomas. It's rhythm, sound, feeling, emotion, history. Oh my goodness gracious. I mean, me I mean, metaphor beyond all recognition. So yeah, and then also, uh, um, I'll, I'll go Sylvia Plath, um, Thomas Lux. I don't know if people know him. He, he died about a year ago. Um, <laughs> Those are the, f Yusuf Komenyaka, Dorian Lux. Um, those are the, those are the ones, because again, she really, oh, she makes hay with sound. I mean, un unbelievable work. And she, um, she's the one I, I really want to um, follow because that woman revises and revises and revises and revises vices over and over and over again um, and sometimes I kind of think it's like am I done and you know there's uh, does anybody know Ellen Bryant Voigt she was the one she tells the story of a woman in a poetry workshop who brought um, and I think it was during some sort of MFA uh, two-week residency this woman brings up brings a poem in <laughs> And then, you know, people, you know, it's like you bring the poem in, and people are like revising it. And she's like, well, you know, um, this isn't a draft. I, I've actually had this poem published. And it's kind of an insult to say, um, I've already had this poem published. It's like, why are you bringing this here? And Ellen Bryan Voigt, that this, this has gone down, it's like, she's like, it's all a draft until you die. <laughs> and it's like that's very true and you know it's like even if you've had something published if, if you can change you can change anything you can change punctuation you can change little things you can change big things and it is it's all a draft until you die and then you're stuck or everybody else is stuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> too bad too bad for everyone else no more no more revisions after that so you know, Amy, I was listening to your poetry, and one of the things that came to mind, especially with your broadside, is how clean your whole poems are, how very judicious you are, in the number of, of, of words you use, in the way that you phrase them, and I remember something I read. I don't know if you've heard of James Baldwin. Yes. Well, I remember, I, I put down quotes. And Kent, when that clean came back to me, he has a statement. You want to write a sentence as clean as a bone. Hmm. And when I look at your poetry, it's just, it's like, it's, it's, it's clean bone. Oh, it's that, that, that is the sweetest, because I always think I'm very mean-spirited about my poems. Slash, 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 slash. And, but I, I'm, I'm, oh, for me, it's, it, it I, I, I like, I like, Tightness, but that comparison to James Baldwin kind of really knocks me flat. Thank you. That's wonderful. Any more questions for Amy? While she's here? <laughs> oh, God, here we go. <laughs> it's fine. Well, I loved all your pieces, but yeah. I was so struck by your poem with the, with the cat um, because oh. it just channeled everybody here with the cat. Yeah. And I wonder if you've done much more with, say, channeling animals or, or the animal as a folk hero or a, or a, you know, a, a figure that um, has wisdom or things happen to the animal as a uh, metaphor. I think I've had a few other cat poems. They, they just aren't, they're just not very good. I'm just saying that. I'm better with an avocado as a metaphor, I swear to God. And I didn't bring my avocado poems. But um, 
it, it's funny what you pick up as a metaphor. And again, an avocado, because I have a poem that's like, the avocado that will not ripen. Yeah. We've all had that, man. It's like, you little idiot. It's like, you're green for two weeks. It, it's funny how, th it's like avocados, um, my cat poems, that was a, that was a good one. That, that, that felt like, that felt pure for me. Um, the other ones I wrote were just kind of silly and throwaways. And it's like, yeah, it's like you do that sometimes. You just write it and it's a draft and then just like, yeah. Or you wait and try to revise it. Um, like for me, again, seasons, weather, bodies, those are, those are better metaphors for me. Um, because I, I, but yeah, my, mostly because I'm so attached to my cats. That's the, that's the heart. I can't get the, I can't get the, the distance from them to make it, but it's just like, yeah, okay. The shedding thing is like, yeah, boom. <laughs> and it was like, it was like 6.05 in the morning and I'm writing this poem like, eh. <laughs> and I swear to God, seriously, don't come anywhere near me because I, I know, I know. <laughs> and I have every color cat. I have three cats. One, one's a Maine Coon. And he's, you know, and it's like, he's got the dark gray hair. And then it's, it's Calpurnia who, she has this gray stuff. It doesn't show up as much. She just leaves it everywhere. It, this was mostly about her. And then I have Angus who has white hair. And he just, she's like, oh, you took your shirt off and it's on the bed. Boom. <laughs> and he said, and it was just like, you're trying to shed on it, aren't you? Yeah. It's like, hey. Yeah. I know. It's like, you little jerk. Okay, fine. No treats for you in the morning. Okay, fine. You'll get the treats. <laughs> I can deny them nothing. But it's funny how metaphors come up. And that, when I was putting this collection together, um, it was the, the, the poems about the body that I used to anchor different sections. And it, it's just funny how that works. When you write certain things, it's like, oh, finally I have a way to anchor a collection together. I always think about the cats. My cat, when I can vacuum and get everything clean, then she walks across the room. And purposefully. And the lions, and it, they just fly off yeah. her hair. <laughs> like, who blew on you? Yeah, it's like, no, if I'm doing this on purpose. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Did you did you bring books? I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. okay. So we got a table back here. Okay, yeah, I know. So I got blue in here late. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we're, we're no glad you got here. Yeah. So anyway. there are going to be books back here on okay. the table. Yes. And maybe you'll be here to uh, sign books. Yes. And, and chat. Yeah. Thank you so much thank for being here. Thank you. I, thank you for welcoming me into your space.